All right, uh, the last of the uh, behavioral disorders that, and genetic relationships that I wanted to talk about um, is one that involves what is known as the MAOA or MAOB genes, these two different genes, they're closely associated with each other. Um, and then there's what's known as uh, the, the outcome of this, the behavioral problem, uh, is known as Werner's syndrome, okay? And so this gene uh, is found on the X chromosome. Um, there's two forms of it. There's a MAOA and MAOB. They obviously one's on one string and one's on the other because they're transcribed in different directions. Uh, but they're located very close to each other. And they play major roles um, in some of the transport systems uh, that are around. So we want to look at those. And we're right now going to concentrate primarily on, on A because that's the one that was defined as having a, a, an issue in the system. Um, this one, the monohydrate oxidase A, um, is, has 15 different exons. Um, the Verna syndrome was really related to, but went on in, in exon seven. Uh, but there have been a number of clinically significant SNPs located along this gene. These are just some of those that have been, have been found there. It's a, it's a fairly long uh, transcript. It's uh, over 90,000 bases, so it's pretty big. Um, and what it's involved in is um, this interactions with neurotransmitters. Uh, almost all of the neurotransmitters uh, that of importance, uh, epinephrine, uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonins. And it, and it helps control the levels of these right, uh, forms. Uh, deficiency in this will cause you to have an excess of one or more of these, of these neurotransmitters. Um, and normal levels, they can be maintained. Um, it was, unfortunately, uh, when, once it was brought in, called the, the warrior gene, uh, because the, the original descriptions of this and, and post descriptions have to do with uh, aggressive individuals, uh, individuals that uh, easily get into fights uh, when they're stimulated. Uh, unfortunately, other things such as uh, lots of antisocial behavior, but uh, things like attempted rape, um, people that you know, fight, that, uh, uh, very aggressive, uh, uh, tends to be all sorts of things. Um, and so this idea that, you know, it's carried on the X chromosome, uh, males would, would you know, have a, a more a larger chance if it's a, it would, because it would behave as, a, as a, a, a hemizygotic condition in males, they would, you know, the warrior gene. Well, it's, it's not a warrior gene, um, but and that's unfortunate. That gets picked up in the, the common literature, and this is how you see, may see it described. Um, these ideas have been going on for a long time. Uh, even you know, early on, back in the 50s, when we first started doing chromosome work, um, and they went in and they, they started just doing karyotyping. Um, and they, the, one of the early studies uh, went in and looked at uh, individuals in, in high security systems, uh, uh, prisons or, uh, or uh, institutions uh, for people who are you know, uh, very um, aggressive criminally, uh, whatever. Uh, and they found a preponderance of XYY uh, in there. And so they said, oh, here we are, you know, XYY, we've got this uh, aggressive male sort of structure. And it was proven once we could actually you know, carry type more individuals, that that wasn't really the case at all. Um, it's come along in, in other systems as, as well. Unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, things that weren't aggressive, but things like, uh, boy, unfortunately, when they first came out in the, uh, late 80s, early 90s, with the mitochondrial Eve story. Uh, the press ran with mitochondrial Eve without any explanation that that, that not what it meant. Uh, that was just a cute way of, of phrasing it. And then there was all this you know, controversy. And the warrior gene story has kind of followed that line of, uh, you know, a sensationalism of, of a, a point taken out of context, really, from the scientific literature. It happens quite often. Um, anyway, this gene um, is interesting because um, there's increased methylation in females and decreased uh, methylation in males, all right? Um, there are a number of, of CG sites. Um, and so we have, uh, obviously, opportunity for methylation to occur. Uh, and naturally, we see a, a difference, too. Um, and not only do we see, and here's some of those CG sites that are found um, of importance, ones that tend to get methylated. 
Okay, uh, and these relate to some of those some of those numbers up there. Um, and, and you see things uh, if there's been sexual abuse of an individual uh, early on, you'll see in, particularly uh, females you'll see increased um, CG methylation going on uh, pretty much across the board. In these not all of them. Okay, there's some sites that aren't, but each one of these little stars, uh, individuals that reportedly had been sexually abused. Um, and, you know, in an early age, I think this goes back to that lax lecture when we talked about uh, you know predisposing individuals to certain things. Okay, um, and you know sometimes this methylation uh, depends on where it is can increase or decrease the effectiveness of the of this um, protein in, in its life and its interactions with um, these neurotransmitters. Um, the, the deficiency of Berner syndrome is a deficiency. Uh, this was uh, reported first in, I think, 1993. Berner was the lead author. That's why it's called Berner syndrome. Uh, this was a Dutch family of about, I think, about, they looked at about 15 people uh, in, through the pedigree. Um, and this was a family that had been involved in, in multiple generations of, of uh, antisocial behavior. Uh, aggressive behaviors uh, and uh, uh, sorts of you know things. Um, there was subsequently, I think, in 90, 2014, there was a French family uh, that that exhibited sort of the same outcomes, the deficiency. Okay, they went in and looked, um, and they were they were deficient in this particular protein in their system, and they, therefore their serotonin and other levels were quite high. Um, and the last report I saw was 2016. Uh, was an Australian uh, family relationship where they were extremely aggressive uh, individuals with a lot of history of uh, things. Uh, generally, there's a low IQ, lower IQ, et cetera, uh, associated with this. The reason I have uh, Stepan Motley up here is that uh, he was an individual um, in uh, Georgia, he, and uh, he was uh, eventually executed for murder in Georgia uh, in 1991. Um, he brutally uh, killed a, a young man that was a student in a, that was uh, in a Domino's, uh, you know, uh, uh, restaurant. Uh, they went in, robbed him, shot the person in the back of the head. Uh, he, up to that point, he'd had lots of, uh, he'd been a difficult child, if you will. He'd been juvenile uh, problems, uh, thieves, lying, uh, lots of, of problems. The uh, reason I mention him is that in his defense, they said there were mitigating circumstances, and they, they argued that he had Brunner syndrome, that he was uh, he was not only deficient, um, and they asked that uh, instead of you know being uh, sentenced to death, uh, that there were mitigating circumstances and that he be tested. Uh, the court uh, disallowed this uh, testing. It eventually went to the Georgia Supreme Court, and they upheld the denial. So he was never actually tested for it. But it was a it's a classic case if you look at any of the literature about. Uh, using sort of uh, sort of this genetic you know, to, as a defense in, in these um, uh, antisocial activity cases, this is the one you'll find, and that was uh, anybody from Georgia. Uh, there's some new research actually out that looks at uh, the things like again like autism, um, and there are some ideas that uh, this this some of the autistic behaviors because there are clearly things related to uh, neurotransmitter production, overproduction of things that in some of the autistic uh, spectrum outcomes uh, that potentially, what about diet changes, things that would uh, you know, lead to, to change in methylation of these regions, maybe increase the methylation or forms. Um, there are, there's potential for some, I mean, long-term use. This is Indian snake root. Um, and, and it's, um, I think it's a member of the milkweed family. Uh, that's been used for, for you know, hundreds of years in, uh, in India and was brought out as a, as a you know, herbal pharmaceutical uh, for lowering anxiety, lowering uh, depression and other things and potentially uh, has a, a role here. And it's been tried uh, for individuals with this deficiency uh, and now being tried in, in for systems of, all, of uh, autism. Um, one of the other less things about this is that uh, there can be some, uh, you know, it appears that, that um, not only do individuals respond to therapies, but that there actually can be a change in the methylation levels due to therapy. 
sounds a little strange, but um, these are these are non-responders down here in the bottom, just like we saw before, who didn't respond to therapy or anything else. Uh, but these are, are females who had panic disorder, and they were found to be hypomethylated. Now, we, we saw earlier that, that females get, you know, higher methylation of these, this particular um, gene. And these were individuals who had panic disorder and they, they turned out that they were hypomethylated. And what happened here is not food or anything else. This was simply therapy, uh, taking these individuals and uh, giving them therapy uh, over time and then going back and look at their methylation levels. And their methylation levels for some of these individuals increased. The people that responded, you know, the responders are responding to the therapy, uh, actually showed a higher increase in methylation levels. So here we've got a, the, the environment in this case is, uh, is a psychological environment, right? And that's causing a, a real epigenetic response uh, in some of these individuals. So it's correcting uh, what was a hypomethylated you know, system and now to a a normal methylation level. There are lots of individuals that don't respond in this way, not responders, but I thought that was really interesting. Uh, you know, it's the reverse of what we saw earlier. Earlier we saw individuals either at high low levels either responded or didn't respond. Here, the response is actually methylation and correcting what was a, a, a low level of methylation, making it uh, into what would be a, a normal level. Um, and, listen, and, and this uh, monohydrate oxidase B, uh, is also an important one. The other gene that we saw a moment ago, uh, it plays a big role in depression and other things. And it's a bit of target, a pharmaceutical target uh, for a number of other uh, areas. Again, because these are all interrelated to uh, neurotransmitters and, and the levels of those neurotransmitters that we have. All right. Now, the last little lecture that I want to do will be just a brief one on animal models. And we'll do that in the next little section.